Why, yes, I meant to tell you. Tom Jones has been transferred. They're moving to Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, no! Well, now, wait a minute. I've been there. It's not so bad. As a matter of fact, it's so nice the population is growing faster than in any other area under the American flag. Wouldn't surprise me if the Joneses like it so well, they'll stay. Tom thought they might. Well, it still must be an awful chore, moving that far. Why, there's nothing to it. You saw the Joneses walk out with a couple of suitcases, just as if they were going on a vacation. The moving men do all the rest. Tom called it moving in the Martin Manor. Well, that china is certainly being packed carefully. I don't see how it could possibly get broken. Oh, of course not. Nothing is ever damaged in the slightest. The Martin Company has a special procedure, almost a ritual for moving household goods. Every Davenport, every chair, every dish, in fact, even the smallest items, are carefully wrapped in the cleanest and softest padding. Anything going to Alaska is transferred to Seattle into an overseas van pack, which is really a small truck body. This gives everything double protection and also makes it very easy to handle. Anywhere you live, Martin Van Lines can move you to Alaska in a jiffy. Well, if that's all there is to it, maybe it would be fun. They say Alaska is beautiful. Here you see the Joneses' household goods has arrived in Seattle, and they've transferred it from the big van to the overseas van pack. All nicely padded. Snug as a bug in a rug. Up she goes into the ship. Everything perfectly protected. All set for Alaska. Oh, there are the Joneses again. Say, this is going to be fun. You're right. Going to Alaska by ocean steamer is one of the most delightful trips in the world. You follow the inside passage, you know. It has fjords just like Norway. I've always wondered, what is an inside passage? Why, it's the space between the islands lying just off the coast and the coast itself. The islands protect the water inside, making it smooth. The inside passage to Alaska is a thousand miles long. It's a busy, well-charted waterway, almost like a river. There, you can see on the map. You sail up the coast with the islands between you and the open ocean. They call it sailing sheltered sea. The first city you reach in Alaska is Ketchikan, 750 miles northwest of Seattle. Fishing is the main industry here. Like most cities of the southeastern or panhandle Alaska, Ketchikan is built on the side of a mountain. Nearly every home has a beautiful view. When we get to Wrangell, a little further up the inside passage, we're in the heart of the totem pole country. Totem poles decorate the city hall and even some of the homes. This chap is building himself a new home overlooking town and harbor in Wrangell. Sailing north, we go through Wrangell Narrows, where you can almost reach out and pick flowers ashore. Here's Petersburg with a daily mail plane landing. Juneau is the capital of Alaska, ringed by towering peaks. It's also the center for nearby gold, nickel, copper, cobalt, and iron mining areas. As on any ocean voyage, seagulls are always with us. Soon we go out into the Gulf of Alaska. You find a more spacious kind of beauty here. Vitus Beering sailed into these waters in 1741. 
discovering and claiming Alaska for Russia. In 1867, we bought Alaska for $7,200,000. It certainly was a bargain. Alaska is one-fifth the size of the United States. It has huge forests, rich farming land, vast mineral deposits, and great natural beauty. Seward is the main seaport for interior Alaska. Its main industry is shipping, but there's some truck farming and dairying, too. Seward and nearby Valdez have the farthest north year-round ice-free harbors in North America. Seward is surrounded by wild game country, but sometimes you have to climb a mountain to find the game. bearded man looking for? Mountain goats. They live up in those crags, believe it or not. On the lower slopes are bear, moose, and smaller animals. The Alaska Railroad begins at Seward and runs north through Anchorage to Fairbanks, a distance of nearly 500 miles. Completed by the federal government in 1923, it served strategically during World War II and was then rebuilt. Today, it's one of the most modern railroads in North America. Train? Why, that's Bartlett Glacier, halfway between Seward and Anchorage. Like nearly all glaciers up north, it's slowly melting and receding. That huge hunk of ice is tens of thousands of years old, and it's so big it doesn't melt very fast. Chicago of the North, a center of defense, industry, mining, and agriculture. Do they go swimming in Alaska? Why, certainly. Summer temperatures up north often are in the 80s and 90s. This is a lake near Anchorage. From Anchorage, a number of airlines fan out to cover the entire North Country. We're going to fly on one of those airlines, Revolution Airways. It flies the longest route of all, 1,300 miles from Anchorage southwest into the central Aleutians. But I thought they had such terrible weather in the Aleutian Islands. Lots of fog and storms. The Aleutian Islands have an undeserved reputation for bad weather. Actually, they have a lot of beautiful weather, but they seldom get credit for it. just at the moment. These are the Ogallene Pinnacles, vertical fingers of rock wearing a glove made of ice and snow. 
We're now flying over one of the heaviest concentrations of volcanoes in all the world. Here we are, right alongside Mount Shisholden, more than 9,000 feet high. This mountain has been smoking like this for centuries. Its nickname is Smoking Moses. You notice there's no snow or ice on its sides. It's too hot. One lake green, the other blue. Almost like a chemist's laboratory. What you see down there is not tundra, it's grass. Grass that often grows six feet high. Abundance of grass and favorable climate make the Aleutian Islands excellent grazing ground. A couple of sheep ranches operate near here. What place is this? This is Dutch Harbor, which was bombed by the Japanese during World War II. We had 70,000 troops quartered here during the height of the war. Today, Dutch Harbor no longer is fortified. One thing that most people don't realize about the Aleutian Islands is that they're the southernmost portion of Alaska. The most southerly Aleutian Island, in fact, is only 249 miles north of the latitude on which Seattle lies. we're back in Anchorage, and we're going to take the Alaska Railroad northward on one of the most exciting train trips you ever saw. Leaving Anchorage, we soon cross Matanuska Valley, a prosperous farming area. Seen from the air, this fertile valley is checkered with green fields that have been hewn out of the forest. Agriculture in Alaska has expanded greatly in the last few years. These are some hunters getting off with their guns and packs. They're going moose hunting. Why, here's a moose now. Better eat fast, young fella. Better yet, get the heck out of here. Or you'll end up hanging on this rack with your daddy. The Alaska Railroad is one of the most northerly railroads in the world. Running nearly 500 miles north from Seward, it almost reaches the Arctic Circle. It crosses five mountain ranges and runs through some of the most scenic country on Earth. Daily trips are made by passenger trains from Anchorage running north and from Fairbanks running south. In each case, the train leaves at 8.30 in the morning and arrives at 8 o'clock in the evening. It's a delightful trip. The Alaska Railroad also has excellent dining car service. Shortly after noon, we get our first view of Mount McKinley. You see it in the distance, partly hidden by clouds. Autumn is one of the most beautiful times to visit Alaska. Trees are aflame with color. Skies are bright. The weather is still warm. The Alaska Railroad runs through the edge of McKinley National Park. A splendid resort hotel is operated there, and these are tourists taking one of the hotel's limousines for a trip 90 miles down into the park. McKinley Park is the home and haven for a large wildlife population. Most of the wild creatures are very tame, for no hunting is allowed inside the park. In autumn, the ptarmigan, very numerous, are changing from their brown summer dress into their winter plumage of white.
Canada Jays are plentiful too. And always ready for a handout. There goes a caribou. These animals are not found in any other national park. Hunting is allowed with a camera, and McKinley Park is a photographer's paradise. Not only amateurs, but professional photographers as well come here to record wildlife in its native haunts and to shoot breathtaking scenery on every hand. The limousine trip with or without camera is an unforgettable experience. The most photographed object of all in the park, of course, is Mount McKinley. The limousine takes you within about 30 miles of the lofty mountain. mountain mass standing alone anywhere on earth. Nearly five vertical miles of rock, snow, and ice. It rises from a plateau only two to three thousand feet high. McKinley Park is our country's second largest national park. The largest one, Katmai National Monument, also is located in Alaska. Going on to Fairbanks, we find another large city, another center for mining, agriculture, industry, and national defense. Gold mining still is important up north, with most of it done by huge dredges that float in the ponds they dig as they move across the tundra. Although Fairbanks is near the Arctic Circle, both cows and higher education flourish here. The University of Alaska, near the city, has one of the finest mining schools in the world. It also has a geophysical institute, where astronomical and radiological research of strategic value is carried on. It's coeducational too. Like other Alaska cities, Fairbanks is growing like Iowa corn, fast. Day and night, the streets are crowded, and there's a chronic housing shortage. You can tell that by just watching how fast a vacant dwelling soon is occupied. Even the igloos are snapped up by eager home seekers as soon as they arrive. Fairbanks is the center of a thriving tourist industry, with vacationers eager to take flights out over the countryside in bush planes. Bob Rice Alaska Tours offers a fascinating trip to an Indian village less than an hour away. The pilot points out a sharp dividing line in the forest below. Permafrost on the shady green side, unfrozen ground on this side. Green spruces over yonder, brown birch trees near us. In the distance lies the broad Yukon River Valley. The village we're going to visit is Minto, on the Tanana River. Population 150 full-blooded Athabascan Indians and two white people, the school teacher and his wife. Mabel, the Indian guide, meets the plane. She tells the tourists her people are happy to welcome visitors. This is really a visit to a bygone age. These people are living very nearly as their ancestors lived for centuries gone by. Their food is mainly fish and game, like those salmon hanging in the sun to dry. Minto is a quiet, restful village, and the Indians are quite happy, though very poor. They do have some labor-saving devices, however, like this fish wheel on the Tanana River. It catches salmon merely by scooping them up as they swim past. The salmon fall into a trough, and the Indians go out and pick them up. It's as simple as that. 
The day before these tourists arrived, a small boy was lost by falling into the river. Most of the villagers gathered on the shore while a search was made. Despite their grief, the villagers welcome the tourists and permit the photographer to take pictures. For sale at the village store are beautiful birch bark baskets. The tourists examine them with great interest, trying to select some they'll buy. The baskets are sewn with willow roots and trimmed with spruce. One of Alaska's greatest man-made assets is its system of sturdy, well-constructed highways. Most of these highways are paved, and they take the traveler through a fairyland of scenic beauty. The motorist who comes prepared for roughing it, who really enjoys outdoor life, will find Alaska's road system an open gateway to enchantment. Most of Alaska's major cities are connected by paved highways, and the motorists from the states can reach this highway system by driving north across Canada and up the Alaska Highway. Lodges are found along the main highways, many of them affording very comfortable accommodations and good meals. Alaska's highways, you can drive straight past the North Pole. Ooh, goodness, that makes me shiver. If you were a real Alaskan, you'd love this. It's cold, certainly. But if you're dressed for winter and prepared for it, Alaska in the cold months is as jolly and friendly as Santa Claus. Alaskans like winter so much, in fact, that they keep most of their highways open, even heating the culverts so ice won't form and clog them up. The highways of Alaska are busy in winter as in summer with freight and passenger vehicles using them constantly. Motorists say that driving at 30 below zero is ideal. Different from all other parts of Alaska is the region around Nome, the historic city where millions of dollars worth of gold have been taken from the underlying sands. Ships arriving at Nome must anchor in the open sea, for there's no deep harbor. Their cargo is unloaded into lighters and hauled ashore. Pack ice freezes over the Bering Sea at Nome in November. It breaks up and melts in June. Three out of every four of the residents of Nome are Eskimos. Like the Indians, they get most of their food from nature. These Eskimo women are picking berries on a tundra slope near the city. The red ones are low bush cranberries. The black ones are lingonberries. Very intelligent and gifted, the Eskimos love to draw scenes of Northland life. There are many artists among them, like Wilbur Wallach. America's only tin mine is located 90 miles northwest of Nome. Working 12 months a year, which it can do because it's an underground mine, it has mainly Eskimos as employees. The tin mine lies in the bleak, barren mountains of Seward Peninsula, 75 miles east of the mainland of Siberia. With the Iron Curtain rustling almost beside them, the Eskimos live in their Quonset hut, happy that the white man's industry has come to provide them with steady jobs. Like other natives in Alaska, they're doing their best to step across the high threshold which separates their Stone Age lives from modern civilization. They just got here in time, too. The film's nearly over. And their household goods got there at the same time they did. Still in the overseas van pack. Yes, sir. Martin Van Lines was on the job all the way. I'd call that a good moving picture. Uh -huh.